Hello. Hi, everyone. My name is Ellen Hertz. Uh, and um, I come in from the Parkinson side uh, into the world of Gaucher disease. So today we're going to talk about the link between Parkinson's disease and Gaucher's disease that uh, Dr. Donald already introduced. And for some of you, you're well aware of this link. Uh, for some of you, it might be new information. So please don't hesitate to ask any questions. And we will start from the scratch. Uh, so what is Parkinson's disease? So I usually describe Parkinson's as a common progressive heterogeneous neurodegenerative disorder. So by common, uh, I mean that two to 3% above the age of 65 has Parkinson's disease today. And when we say progressive neurodegenerative disorder, that means that the neurodegeneratives means that the cells in the brain is continuously dying and it's progressive, so it they continue to die. And by heterogeneous, I really want to emphasize that this disease is extremely heterogeneous on an individual level. Some patients have a slowly progressive neurodegenerative disease, and some unfortunately have a more, um, uh, a more aggressive pathway. So what is then Parkinson's disease? So it's diagnosed by the clinical features of what's called Parkinsonism. So that is bradykinesia, which is slowness of movement, tremors, which is also shaking, and or rigidity. So it's a completely clinical diagnosis. And that is those symptoms we call motor symptoms, which is mostly what most people think about when they think about Parkinson's disease. It's the shaking palsy. But a lot of patients also exhibit so-called non-motor symptoms, and that can be depression, cognitive decline, loss of smell. And as you can see in the figure, um, there are, uh, on the timeline, some of these non-motor symptoms can start years or even decades before the start of the motor symptoms that eventually lead to the diagnosis. And then as you see, as time goes by, there can be complications both on the mo non-motor symptoms and on the motor symptoms. And what is then happening in the brain? So what is happening is that cells that were supposed to produce a substance called dopamine are dying. So we see dopaminergic cell death and we see so-called Lewy bodies, which is uh, clumps of proteins that are mostly filled with a protein called alpha-synuclein, which we will get back to. And when it comes to treatment, unfortunately today we don't have anything that can halt the progression. But we do have dopamine replacement therapy, so in various forms that can all often alleviate many of the symptoms. So how come this link then between this neurodegenerative disorder that is mostly uh, diagnosed in elderly or at least above the age of 65 and Gaucher's disease, which is often diagnosed by pediatricians? So it was actually clinical observations of Gaucher patients that also developed Parkinson's disease um, and their relatives that revealed that GBA1 mutation is the most common genetic risk factor that we know of today for Parkinson's disease in any cohort. So this was a very important paper uh, published in 2009 where they looked at a number of different cohorts all over the world uh, and looked at um, if you carry any GBA mutation. So it doesn't matter if you have one or just is a carrier or has two and has Gaucher's disease. But if you have any GBA mutation, it seems like you're having an increased risk of Parkinson's disease of approximately five times the risk of the general population. And you could also look at specific mutations like L44P, which is common in Sweden, uh, or N370S, which is common uh, in the Ashkenazi Jewish population, all of them show this increased risk of Parkinsonism. And even though five times risk might sound a lot and a little bit scary, this is my most important slide and my most important message today. The vast majority of patients with Gaucher's disease or mutation carriers will never develop a Parkinson's disease. 
Uh, and I think that Dr. Donald also emphasized this in her former talk when you said that you have six out of 224 patients. Um, so this is a graph that shows how, uh, with age, how many patients, uh, how large is the percentage that do not have Parkinson's disease? So uh, in the, uh, the first graph is the non-carriers. And you can see by 80, there are a few percent that has Parkinson's disease. Then we have the GBA1 carriers, so relatives of Gaucher's patients. And then we have the patients with uh, Gaucher disease. And I think it, it should really be mentioned that these numbers vary a lot between studies. Um, of course, for patients with Gaucher's, it's a rare disease from the beginning. And then this is a, another rare event. So it is very hard to get specific statistics on like how, how large is actually the risk. Uh, from this study, uh, as you can tell, it seems like maybe the patients with Gaucher is, has a, an earlier diagnosis of Parkinson's disease, but by the time you get to 80, the risk of having one or two mutations are basically the same, which is a little bit surprising. And I think this is partly due to the fact that we actually don't know why GBA1 mutations is causing a Parkinsonism in the end. Because neither what we call a loss of function or gain of function can explain the entire picture. So we're having, we have this enzyme, gluco glucosocerebrosidase, which in a loss of function would, uh, would then cause that Okay, so we have lipid accumulation like we're doing Gaucher's disease, which we know can affect alpha synuclein that I mentioned were in these protein clumps in the brain and that that would cause uh, Parkinsonism. Also the fact that uh, glucoserberosidase is a lysosomal enzyme that should break down proteins in the cell. And maybe if it's not functioning properly, alpha synuclein can't be broken down as it should. However, if, if it was only a loss of function, then most patients with Gaucher's disease should probably get Parkinson's disease, and we know that's not the case. And, but then the other option would be that it would be what we call a gain of function. So basically um, that a mutation in glucocerebrosidase makes the, that the protein can't really fold properly. So it, it takes another shape in the cell. And this other shape, maybe makes it so it can't go through its normal uh, pathway in the cell. And therefore it aggregates and it becomes toxic. There has also been theories saying that alpha synuclein can inhibit the lysosomal activity of glucose uh, cerebrosidase. Um, and then, then it can't uh, break down, uh, then the lysosome function worse, it can't break down alpha synuclein, and then you have a feedback loop that just swirls uh, forward. But there are flaws in both uh, or all three hypotheses. Um, so we don't really know why exactly why GBA1 mutations are causing Parkinson's today. If we then look at the clinical differences between Parkinson's disease with a GBA mutation or without a GBA mutation, uh, there are, at an individual level, there are no clinical differences between Parkinson's patients with or without a GBA mutation. If we're looking at the group level, uh, there is data suggest, uh, saying that if you have a GBA1 mutation, there is a slightly more aggressive um, uh, uh, progression of the disease. Um, and uh, there is a larger risk of developing dementia. But again, on the individual level, there, there's no way we can tell from clinical practice if there is a GBA mutation as a risk factor. Also, when looking at patients with Gaucher disease and Parkinson's disease, we know that, again, there is a wide het heterogeneity in the disease. Some patients still have a very slow progressive disorder that responds well to treatment, and some unfortunately have a more aggressive phenotype. And again, unfortunately, we don't understand 
why we have these different phenotypes or how it's affect different individuals. This other stu study to the right, um, I found very interesting, it was published a few years ago when they looked at uh, glucosyl ceramide. So the lipid that should, um, that accumulates in um, Gaucher's disease. And they looked in uh, controls and Parkinson's patients in the brains. And they actually saw a slight increase of glucosyl ceramide in the brains of Parkinson's patients. And I should mention that this was patients without a GBM1 mutation. So apparently there, is, there seems to be a connection uh, also without the actual mutations, but also in, patient, in Parkinson's patients without mutations that actually has an affected glucose uh, cerebrosidase efficacy. And there are a lot of ongoing studies now how the GBA1 carriers are effective. So we know that there is an increased risk for uh, Gaucher patients, and there are uh, also an increased risk of carriers. And of course, this is not the, what we normally see as a Mendelian uh, genetic disorder where it, one mutation should not affect you. And, but if you have two, then you get the disease. And there are a lot, of, a lot of different studies right now trying to understand how the carriers are affected. Uh, and to be frank, usually we don't see so much differences. So here was one study where they looked at how, um, how many dopamine cells or how much of a binding you have of dopamine cells in the brain. And as I said, those are the cells that die when you have Parkinson's disease. So if you were diagnosed with a Parkinson's disease, the both carriers with GBA1 mutation or Gaucher patients with Parkinson's disease had a lower dopamine um, binding, which is what we should expect. Uh, but if we look in the comparison between the healthy controls, the carriers and patients with Gaucher disease, there is no difference. So we can't tell the difference until it seems like we already see the clinical differences. So here we can see that there is a risk of in the future the developing Parkinson's disease. And uh, if we have, uh, here was a study that was published just uh, a few months ago where they looked at the other lipid that should be accumulated in, um, uh, in uh, uh, Gaucher's disease, sorry. So we have the two different lipids that uh, Professor Cox talked about. So glucosyl sphingosin or lysogl one And they could actually see a small increase um, with uh, a G carrying one GBA1 mutation. So as you see there, are, they compared uh, uh, patients or persons, I should say, with no carriers of, of the mutation and no Parkinson's disease with carriers and no Parkinson's disease. And there is a slight increase. And you see the same slight increase in patients with Parkinson's disease. However, I really wanna highlight that as you see that there is actually no difference between the uh, carriers that have Parkinson's disease or does not have Parkinson's disease. So we can't say that this should be a biomarker for developing Parkinson's disease because also the, patient, the persons that only have a mutation but doesn't have Parkinson's disease has a slightly higher uh, lipid accumulation in their bloods. The other thing I wanna highlight here is the, uh, they had four patients with Gaucher disease and as you can see, they are of course a lot higher, uh, which we should expect. Uh, and also this is not only higher as what we think of when we look at it, um, because the scale here is actually also uh, stopped in the middle or like trapped in the middle. So we're going from maybe half a nanogram per milliliter to 7.5 or one. And here is at least 10 to 
even hundreds or 150. So there, are, uh, even though this increase in carriers is significant, uh, there is a very large increase to uh, to actually the the numbers that we see in Gaucho's disease. I think I talked a lot faster than I did when I practiced. Are there any questions? Or was it understandable at all? I have a question. Yes. Uh, if we, if uh, Parkinson um, patients have higher um, level glucose cerebrosis oh. of the left, uh, I usually yes. say. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, couldn't be um, useful to take. Uh, um, Benglustat. I, I will. That will be my next slide. I should mention that uh, the study that I showed that showed the increase in the brain of the lipid. That is the only study I've seen so far that could show that increase in the brain. There are a number of studies of Parkinson's patients where they can't see the increasement of lipids in the brain. So this is also a matter of It seems to depend on which regions of the brains we are measuring in, and also depending on which method you use to measure. It's not really settled in the field. Um, but if it, so, there might be a small increase, but there are also studies showing that there, there might be no difference between the two. Um, So then if we go to the next slide, since you asked about it, the Venglostat study, because of course this, this new uh, understanding of one reason or one risk factor of Parkinson's disease has spurred a lot of interest in clinical trials. And as Professor Cox mentioned, there is this Venglostat and it was tried in Parkinson's disease with GBA1 mutations uh, in a large international study a few years ago. Unfortunately, they did not see any, um, any progression or slowness of progression. Uh, there is also ongoing studies with Ambroxol, which has also been a discussion in the Gersher uh, community, uh, which is a chaperone uh, moving uh, glucocerebrosidase easily to the, or to facilitate the movement of the, lys the enzyme to the lysosome. And they have only done the, uh, the first uh, study, which is of course, to first you look at if it's safe or not. Uh, and it seems to be safe, that was published in 2020. And there are ongoing trials to see if it's actually effective. Uh, in the, uh, and then as uh, Professor Cooks also mentioned, there are gene therapies with AAV viruses um, that is ongoing, but that is very early and it's, only, it's still only for trials uh, or for safety to see if it's safe. So there are a lot of things coming up, but so far we, uh, we're still very early and uh, trying to understand that it's firstly safe, maybe. Uh, Thank you. More questions. I must have talked so much faster than when I practiced. I have a question, if I may. Yes. So what is the current knowledge about the, uh, the mechanism behind the neurological part of Gaucher's disease? Since as I understand it, um, there is no accumulation of Gaucher cells in the brain, but there is some, some other mechanism going on here. It's... And, uh, we have a daughter with type two, but yeah, she's two years old now. And we have a lot of thoughts about the treatment. She's receiving enzyme replacement therapy right now, and it works really good for the rest of, of her body, but maybe not the brain, that we don't know really. But if, if now the, the, um, the symptoms, the neuro neurological part, partly depends on 
um, um, lipids, so this uh, uh, glucosyl ceramide may be traveling from the rest of the body to the brain, if that is part of the, uh, of the uh, mechanism behind the disease. But uh, this uh, ERT is not considered to be effective against uh, Gaucher type 2 patients. But what is known about the, uh, the, uh, the mechanism behind the ne neurological part? And so maybe this question is for you, but also for Dr. Donald and Professor Cox. Exactly. I was just going to say, since I come from the Parkinson's side and into the Gaucher world, I, 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 the the lipid accumulation it that I talked about, I was mostly referring to what we see in Parkinson's patients. Yeah, that's I understand. Um, uh, in Gaucher type two, now I think the, the other two doctors here should probably correct me. It, it seems to be more of a, uh, that lipid, there is more common that you see lipid accumulation in also within the brain. Um, but for some reason, the, as far as I've understood it, that as you mentioned, the, it's not the and some replacement therapy does not really seem to alleviate the neurological symptoms. I think that's that's one of the large steps that we need to to understand better um, yeah. why it works so so well for for the, for the body but not for the brain. Hello, and there's. Tim Cox here. Sorry, I have an unstable connection, I'm sorry to say. I don't know if you can hear me. I hear you perfectly. Thanks. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, it is a very complicated thing, and I'm, I'm sorry for your very difficult situation at home, but th there's something very odd. If I could just chip in, there's something, it's partly a personal opinion, but it, it, it seems to be the case a bit now. There's something very odd about the inheritance of Parkinson's disease um, in, in the context of Gaucher. Um, and what we do now know is that many of the genes implicated in Parkinson's disease um, and uh, are, are lysosomal, lysosomal proteins that do with lysosomal function and also another organelle, the mitochondrion, both are genetically implicated in Parkinson's sporadically and indeed uh, it seems that other lysosomal genes um, and other lysosomal diseases are causes um, of a risk for Parkinson's disease. For example, mutations in, the, in, a, in a very related condition, Fabry disease. So it seems to be a lysosomal defect in part, partly sphingolipid biased, that is say a certain group. Mm -hmm. The inheritance in relation to Gaucher disease is complicated in that the homozygotes, that is say people with Parkinson's disease, the, the, the milder form, the type one form particularly at risk, it's thought they don't have a very much greater risk actually uh, than the heterozygotes, which is very odd. And it suggests that something to do with the mutant protein as well, or the particular defect itself. Uh, it's a, it's related very specifically to, to what goes wrong. Um, and so um, there, it is more slightly more, but I mean, we have only six or seven out of 250 in the UK, you know, and that's a bit odd. But as been <clears throat> pointed out, the people who do get it um, have often have a family history of it happening. So it's, it speaks to a gene that's being operating in cis co-transmitted or very closely related, all right? So um, the, the genetics, I think, do tell us something together. It's a lysosomal defect. Generally, the neurons need lysosomes in order to survive their entire life of 60, 70, 80 years, yes? Um, and, and they're very active metabolically as they are from the point of view of the mitochondria. And then any small defect over a long period of time will lead to compromise of those mitochondria and those neurons that are very, very active indeed. And these are the, the dopaminergic and some of the other types. So it's, it's a complicated matter, but um, the, it's not a singular relationship to Gaucher. It's, it was revealed in part through Gaucher. Absolutely. It, it seems to be 
I think that everybody from the beginning felt that, oh, now we have a, a very good model for this. And then when people started to look closer onto it, it was not as easy at, as it looked from the beginning. It's, it's, no. it's a very no. complicated, re complicated relationship between Gaucher's disease and Parkinson's disease. And, and, and the animal studies which informed the very well-designed trial that you'll know, of course, the MOVES trial you were referring to, uh, where Venglistat was tried very rigorously. He's given us an enormous amount of experience with Venglistat and dosing and, and so on. But the fact that it didn't show an effect and it was well-conducted trial, beautifully invested in, would be very crushing in a sense for the company in a way, and everyone would be disappointed. Mm -hmm. But in fact, it tells us a lot, doesn't it? Um, that's, it does. that, that, that it's, it's quite informative in, in, in keeping on the search um, uh, beyond simple chemistry mm -hmm. and animal experiments. <laughs> And also, as mentioned, that we don't really know the, if the lipid accumulation does matter for developing Parkinson's disease. No. Um, uh, it, I should say that it's still a matter of debate, I would say. Absolutely. <laughs> yes. 